if you're an innovator in 2022 and you're looking at climate, I mean, there is more capital available for you than you could ever have imagined in a different situation. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. Well, you know, an interesting thing happens when you record a special series and you have to do it ahead of time, which is that a lot can change in the world between when you record it and when you release it. Um, This conversation today, uh, we recorded prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and it's a conversation focusing on energy. And there's a lot of stuff in there. I think all of it's still relevant, but the context in which you might hear it or interpret it is in some ways going to be necessarily a little different after what has happened uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, particularly around the prevalence of hydrocarbons, uh, their connection to Europe, Russia's power, and also nuclear power, which has been at the center of the story. Um, We touch on it in this conversation. You've got civilian nuclear power in the form of nuclear power plants in Ukraine, which have been fired upon, attacked, or occupied by Russian forces. There's safety concerns there. There's also, of course, nuclear weapons, which have been, you know, hinted at or or pointed to by uh, the Putin regime. So we figured it was worth keeping in all the discussion on nuclear because it's still relevant, even though I think there's ways in which the context of it or the concerns around safety might be heightened now in light of the recent developments. All right. Very, very quick history of human life on the planet. Uh, we've been around as a species for like 250,000 years, somewhere in that ballpark for 99.9999999999% of that we're basically operating off solar power. You know, we use the sun, the sun grows stuff. We use it to feed us. Uh, we come up with some mills on water. We dam water. We come up with wind, some wind that we can use to harness, But mostly we got to operate with like the energy budget of just what's extant and around. And civilizations rise and fall. Uh, You get, you know, all kinds of different levels of development, different places. But that's the binding constraint on all human life for the first 99 point, again, 999 percent. Then around the 19th century, we begin to pull out of the ground essentially billions of years worth of sunlight trapped in fossils that we start burning. And all of a sudden, human indices of wealth, generation, human activity, population, all that stuff, hockey sticks. That is the, (laughs) there's two ages. There's like the age before that, the age before fossil fuels and plentiful energy in in the age afterwards. The things that we're able to do, everything that we consider modern life is undergirded by that energy budget an energy budget where we got access to 5 billion years of worth of solar power when everyone who came before us just had whatever solar activity was happening in that moment. Now we have to move to the next phase, right? So phase three is the one we're about to enter into. That's where we keep modern life. We don't go back to operating off of the energy budget of just what's extant in that day's sun and the sort of ecosystem But we stop burning fossil fuel completely because the burning of fossil fuel produces carbon in the atmosphere that is creating a planet that will be less and less habitable, heading towards two degrees Celsius in temperature rise, could go as high as six or seven. At six or seven, you're talking about like true dystopic apocalyptic scenarios of maybe not supporting human life. So we got to cut off before then. The goal ostensibly now, I guess, is 1.5, but everyone says we're going to overshoot that. And the biggest question in the future of series we're doing, the most important question for human life on the planet is what the future of energy looks like. That's the one question. Everything is subordinate to that. Everything cascades off of that. Every question about human life, about human politics, about society, culture, geography, war and peace, everything is subordinate to the question of what the next source of human energy will be. That's the number one question. And if you're going to devote your life to doing one thing, I think that would be the thing to devote your life to. And today's guest has devoted his life to that. His name is Jonah Goldman, and he's the managing director of Breakthrough Energy, which is a really interesting 
undertaking. We'll learn more about it. I feel like I don't quite understand what it is. It calls itself a network sharing a commitment to achieve a path to net zero emissions by 2050. You may have heard about it when Bill Gates basically made it one of the the sort of big projects he was investing in. It's a private public fund. It's backed by Gates. Its vision is to essentially help solve that very question. What is phase three of human life on the planet energy source? What does that look like? And so I'm really uh, excited to have Jonah Goldman on the program. Thanks so much, Chris. My mother's going to be very proud of the way that you set that up. I mean, I feel a little bit more nervous than I did before because I feel like the <laughs> weight of the world's on the sho- on my shoulders. But it 100 percent is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing the most important thing, and if you don't figure it out, we're hosed. So let's start with what do you think of that history of human humanity? Is that track with how you think about this? Yeah, I mean, we may have started emitting fossil fuels a little bit earlier than than maybe you suggested, but still, yeah, that's generally right. Yeah, you know, the history of human civilization is is an energy story as much as it's any other kind of story. I mean, starting way back when we were hunters and gatherers and then the way that we were able to create agriculture had a or, or agricultural productivity had a lot to do with the way we were able to harness energy at that point it was like you said yep. it was you know it was how we could deal with our caloric intake significant enough to be able to have the you know wherewithal to go and do the things that we do and yeah and we've created this this really i mean you know sometimes we we like to say how terrible it is it's a really remarkable modern lifestyle that we've created. I mean, it's it's pretty incredible. If you look at the course of human history from before that moment till after that moment, I think every one of us, once we made the decision to stop just being hunters and gatherers and living in civilizations and starting to create these kind of collective yeah. um, opportunities to thrive, you know, that was a moment where maybe people can argue which which side of the of the divide you come to. Oh, and, and they, they do. do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean. But if you're on our side of the divide in the sense that, like, you're going to say, OK, we're not going back to that situation, you'd much rather live in a life. You'd much rather live your life after the moment of energy yes. realization than before, because, you know, you get to live longer, you get to live healthier, you get to live with many more things that you that we take for granted. So, yeah, let me let me correct myself and say, I think I said I meant 18th century. I think I said 1800s. But I meant 18th century, 1700s is when it really starts to kick into gear. Yeah, you know, those sorts of things were even before we we started right. digging lots and lots of fossil fuels. But still, yeah, that's just that's just about it. Civilization is a sto- is an energy story. Let's talk a bit about what your sure. background is. Like what what do you do? <laughs> what's your what's your job? That's a good question. Let me just sort of lay out why we're doing what we're doing in the way we're doing it and then my job is to help hopefully help the incredibly talented team we have um, you know, succeed at the, at the thing we're trying to do. So, you know, we started this with like, you know, the world story is an energy story and the way that we live our modern lifestyle is based on a series of products that are ubiquitous. I mean, like if any of us looks around our rooms or I'm looking at your room and you're looking at my room and like every single thing I see has some contribution to climate change because it was based on some level of fossil fuels, like from clothes to cabinets to everything. Yep. Um, and that's in addition to all of the transportation pieces, which of course add to that, but even just the manufacturing of these, everything we see in everybody's house all was created with some impact to, to climate change. And so when we think about what the modern lifestyle is based on, it's based on these products and services that are basically, you know, um, we've spent a century over a century. I mean, we've just gone through that creating really the most efficient markets on the planet to be able to deploy those things and make them really, really cheap, which, you know, if it weren't for fossil fuels, we could like pat ourselves on the back and be like, look at this incredible innovation that's happened over the course of centuries to be able to allow us to live and talk like we're talking right now. And so the purpose of Breakthrough Energy is to say, well, we're not going back to that other, to that history. That's just unrealistic. And also we don't want to. And so how do we remake all of these products and services? How do we impact these markets and how do we create a network of basically these things that we rely on in a new way? The way that you do that is through innovation, through market creation, through policy, through um, new ways of driving these markets, new ways of incentivizing the private sector to act in a way that understands that this climate imperative is a critical imperative to the success of their own in- industries and businesses. 
And so what Breakthrough Energies, why we're designed the way that we are, is to either directly commercialize new technologies or to be a model for how you can commercialize new technologies. Because we're not going to be able to do it in the way that we did it before. You know, we think that that means massive investments in early stage innovation, and it means massive investments in deploying current technologies, but it really means shaping market structures so we can do them, these things in a way that the whole world can adopt them. And that's the big thing that often gets left out of a lot of climate conversations is that the only way that we're successful is if the whole world does this. If any part of the world decides we don't do it, then we're just not successful. It's a very hard concept, actually, for humans to really totally appreciate because, you know, we don't live in a global world as much as we're more interconnected and we can fly around and things like that. We live in our own individual worlds and we can see things that are that are deeply, deeply impactful to our world and then think they are they are therefore impactful to the whole world. And in the climate situation, that's where that gets proven wrong. And so it's not just about us being able to say, how do we get out some more EVs in rich countries or how do we get a more solar arrays in, you know, sunny parts of Europe? It's how do you transform this for the places on the planet that right now don't have the access to reliable and affordable energy that we take for granted and not stop that progress. It is altruistic. Like I want everybody on the planet to live as as wonderful a life as I have this you know, incredible luck to live. It's also just essential because they're not going to not do that. If you, you know, right, right. If you see others living a lifestyle that makes sense for you to live, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do it. Right. And you should certainly shouldn't be penalized because you weren't the ones who created this, this problem to begin with. Yeah. I mean, I want to just take a moment to sort of hang a lantern on an ideological construct here, which I think is important to note and not argue it with you. But just to say that in the broad coalition of people that care about climate change and want to see it addressed, there's kind of roughly two camps. And I think I'm oversimplifying (laughs) a little bit, but the This Changes Everything camp, which is a a title of a book by Naomi Klein, is basically that the fossil fuel problem is essentially the manifestation of like the original sin of industrial capitalism and that to fix it, you need to fix and reimagine global industrial capitalism, right? That you need to sort of reconfigure human systems and institutions. That's one way of thinking about the problem. Another way of thinking about the problem is like, global industrial capitalism is pretty great, gave it a lot of great stuff, just putting a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. Can we keep it going? And and the kind of development that we've seen in, say, the global South, China and India, can we keep it going, but just doing it with technologies that mean that we're not heating the planet? And that's very much the framework that is the latter one is the one that you're operating out of. And I just want to like (laughs) highlight that for anyone that's listening and thinking themselves they are in another school on this, not to argue that point, but that just that that's the school that you guys are approaching this out of. Yeah. Although, I mean, and this is, I think, probably going to be evident through the conversation. Our idea is that there's not a lot of choices when it comes to the things we're doing. Like you kind of have to do everything, right? That I agree with. And you also have to be laser focused on the problem you're trying to solve. The critique of like modern industrial capitalism and the fact that there are many people who've lost out on the riches that have been bestowed by that structure is a like a very important and interesting conversation. It's not a climate conversation because under no circumstances are people, would people be excited about a history that doesn't include fossil fuels? And the fact that we created a structure over the last century and a half to deploy them very cheaply and to do it in a way that was efficient in like mind boggling ways until about the seventies was not just good, it was like, in, it was miraculous. Yeah. And there was no problem with the incentive structure to be able to create that system. You know, I mean, I, you think back to like various moments in history. I mean, you know, when LBJ was forcing power lines across the entire country, those were mostly powered by fossil fuels. And, you know, thank God he did that because we're much, yeah. much better as a country because of it. And as despite the fact that we still have to struggle with poverty and we still have to struggle with local air pollution and we still have to struggle with these very, very real issues, every community is better because there's electrification. And so I find it often 
people were always looking for the, for the evil people. It's always easier to, to, to create those dichotomies and then to live within that kind of a structure. And the point that I have is that if we're really looking at the villains in the climate conversation, it's all of us. I mean, we want to live the lifestyle that we live and we want to have the access to health and the access to, you know, the, the lifestyle that um, allows us to live much, much longer and much, much healthier and much happier lives than, than we ever did before. And that is a fossil fuel story. And if until we decide that we just don't want to do that anymore, like we can villainize companies, we can make other people out to be the villain, but that's not going to help us solve the problem. I don't see how that helps us solve the problem. And there's practical right. problems with that in the sense that those are the companies that understand how to deliver reliable and affordable energy better than anybody else. They've got engineers that know how to do that. They've got investors that know how to do that. They've got, you know, they've got technology that knows how to do that. And they're the best in the world at it. And we can either say, no, you should stay on the sidelines and we're going to start this all over. That's going to delay us by, you know, decades or centuries. Or we can be like, do you want to be part of the solution? And if you want to be part of the problem, like, right there are things we can do to make sure that that is a much harder thing to do to be part of the problem. But I don't know. I feel like there's not, at least my assessment of this situation, there aren't a whole lot of people we can be like, no, thanks. Like you go and do your own thing. It's too big a problem. Right. Let's talk about how to frame the problem. And it's an energy problem. Most of the energy that the world uses creates carbon yeah. pollution. <laughs> and we have to get to a point where we're net zero by 2050 is that you yeah. know, your goal. What's the best way to start thinking about that or breaking that up? I know there's a million different ways. There's different like pie charts sure. people do. There's the wedges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's different people ways people visualize it. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Like, how do yeah. you conceptualize it? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the way that breakthrough energy is is organized is around a threshold construct and then a sector sectoral construct. Our threshold construct is that we're only really interested in commercializing technologies that are able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by half a gigaton a year, approximately a percent of what we do every year. The reason why we do that is because it's easy to get seduced into sort of small solutions in this, pro in this problem that is never going to end up scaling. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that then you have to look at, like, where are the emissions coming from? And so, you know, we think about five grand challenges. People think about four sectors. It doesn't really matter how you break it down. It's basically like everything we do. It's like how we live, how we move, how we eat, how we make things. You know, those are the kinds of things that we need to change. And at that point, what we really look at is where are the, you know, best interventions. So where are you going to have the most impact? You know, electricity, for example, changing electricity generation, huge impact because it's about, you know, it's about a quarter of emissions right now. But it has the potential to solve a lot more than a quarter of the problem because we can electrify a whole bunch of things. So that's a really important thing. So let's make sure that we're doing that. We're not doing nearly enough. With that right now, you know, we're not deploying wind and solar. There's this very what I think is a misguided and antiquated conversation about nuclear, which is right now producing more greenhouse gas free energy than any other type of generation in the U.S. There is transmission situ problems. So you really have to look at each of those things, break it down and say, if you're going to deal with the everything, you can't just go and say, I'm dealing with the everything. Right. Like, right. You have to say. A percent is a meaningful amount of this stuff. How do we go and execute against something that's going to get us a percent? How are we going to get 5%? How are we going to get 7%? And then go and do it in a really meaningful way and recognize that like, you either have to participate in structures that were created for other types of technologies. That's really hard because you know the whole system is incentivized through a level of innovation and then capital return and you know, more innovation and then higher capital return. And oftentimes we're not going to be able to live that linear path of growth through this site type of issue. So then you have to say, well, what are the ways that you address that? Now there's market structures, there's policy structures, there's innovation, there's, you know, leapfrogging that you can occasionally do. And you just basically have to say, what are the problems? What is the solution for that particular problem? Where is the technology and what needs to happen next? But you need to do that with everything. And that's hard, <laughs> but it's not like impossible. It really is. You can look at it as the most pessimistic thing in the world, which is like the likelihood of us being able to reshape the everything that we do in a short period of time. It seems nearly impossible and it might be, but the opportunities for innovation is everywhere. Like the opportunity to, yeah, yeah it's incredible. This is the thing that's very exciting to me, right? Because 
I, I've been thinking a lot about this, and this relates to another project I'm working on. But like, I think we are in a moment that's like our future vision is very dystopian, and utopian thinking just doesn't exist. Like, if people ask for the what's a utopia, you can't. You know, we don't have our version of 1920s Metropolis, 1896 Columbian Exposition. Um, an AP nine do, I guess it was, you know, Star Trek. I mean, there are these like Star Trek and, and Metropolis and, and the Columbian Exposition. You know, these are moments of sort of a lot of techno optimism, a huge amount of development, 1890s, 1920s, 1960s. All we have are like dystopian visions of the future. Yeah. That's all we got, <laughs> which I think is actually toxic and innervating and bad and dangerous to solving the problem. The thing that's exciting to me here is the transformation of human life on the planet to essentially a zero cost energy world, a cheap, plentiful energy, which is basically what we're going to have to get to, which seems impossible, but maybe not. <laughs> but like even starting in the electricity question, right? I mean, the stuff that's been happening in solar, particularly in wind, is really exciting and feels like it's happening faster than like a lot of people thought it would happen. And the trajectories there have outpaced expectations in a way that I think there's like a little bit of an encouraging story to tell in that universe. Yeah, I mean, we have to make sure that we don't suffer from unproductive pessimism or unproductive exuberance. Right. I mean, the truth is, is that right. like yeah. the solar story is a 60 year story. The solar story was very, right, right, very right, 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 right. It was a huge right. amount of investment. It was an enormous amount of false starts and failures. And we still end up having an intermittent energy source that's hugely powerful. I mean, solar, I think, in the last assessment was somewhere in around 3% in the U.S. I mean, the U.S. has is blessed with incredible solar resources. I mean, you know, we have the Southwest that is, an, is really amazing. You know, you got sunlight for a long time. Yeah. It's a lot of sunlight. It's a lot of space where people don't live and you're not interrupting society. And yet, we're nowhere near where we should be with solar. Same thing with wind, but we can build solar and wind and then we still have another problem with electricity, which is like, how do you make that reliable? And that's really hard. I mean, you know, but great. Like, yes, yeah, solar, the solar and wind journey should be an optimistic journey, but we shouldn't think that everything is going to follow that. If you ask anybody, hmm. what are the, what are the like huge, ma what's the magic of, of like climate smart technology? They'll say solar, they'll say wind, and they'll say EV and that EVs. And you'll say, then what's the fourth thing? And it's silence. And there's not like, it's hmm. not been people working on these things, but like, who is the one who's going to tell you, oh, cement or seat or steel or the like fundamental building blocks of how we build everything that we build in modern cities. And nobody's going to give you a really good answer of, of solar or wind or EVs. And the reason why is because those things are even harder than solar, wind and EVs, which are also really hard. I mean, great, because the difference between the way that solar winds and EVs had to develop, which is they had to develop with a market that questioned their value mm -hmm. to the overall market structure, mm -hmm. whereas everything else now, that, that, that question is largely silenced. You know, really? the U.S., we still have some people who, who are climate deniers, sure, but that is not what you see in private industry. It's not what you see in the vast majority of governments. If you look at recovery funds, in 2008, and you look at recovery funds after the pandemic, the idea of a green recovery in 2008 was a joke. It like just didn't happen. Everything went away. And then people focused on one failure with Solyndra, which was just like nonsense. You know, the LPO right. did a great job of picking pretty good investments. Yep. Now you look at Europe, you look at the infrastructure bill that we passed here, you look at Asia, like the, it is a green recovery that people are counting on. That is a big, big different signal to business. The way that we think about it often at Breakthrough Energy is that transitions only happen in capitalist economies when something is either better or cheaper. And the problem from a climate perspective is what you're talking about is some is a transition to something that's more expensive and often less good yeah. for what it's supposed to be doing, right? Like coal, as terrible as it is for the environment, is pretty damn good at giving you reliable electricity. Whereas like solar, mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the, I'm pretty sure every single day there is going to be hours where solar can't generate electricity. But we we're, we're have to force that transition. And so what we're seeing is, a, is the capitalist system at least defined by investors, board members, customers, employees. Those are very important constituents in any kind of capitalist structure. 
all of them are saying it's now better, faster, cheaper, and it has to be climate conscious. And that is a new thing. That's a brand new thing. How new? Like, when's that? I mean, I'll say, you know, I've been doing this breakthrough energy thing. I've been involved with it since Bill started it in 2015. If you look at COP in 2015, so COP 21 versus COP 26 or COP 27. Right. And as we move to COP 27, it's a world of difference. Hmm. I mean, like there are there's plenty of places for us to be disappointed and we need to be inspired by that disappointment because we need to push everything further. But you know, you're talking about a situation where CEOs of major companies with a significant amount of capital understand what their climate plans are. And, you know, we should talk about the value of individual climate plans, but they know what they are and they they have to report that to their boards and they have to. That was not at all the case when we were in Paris in 2015. And so it's a short period of time, but there's a durability to it because of the fact that these like recovery funds those are real dollars, appropriated dollars, and that's how we think about it here. They're budgeted dollars in other parts of the world. They're real dollars going to real projects that are going to really like build the infrastructure for this kind of stuff. And then you have companies that are making real commitments to their boards and real commitments from their supply chains and other things that are going to have significant impact. And so if you're a, an innovator in 2014 who cares about climate, you're kind of looking at a wasteland. Whereas if you're an innovator mm. in 2022 and you're looking at climate, I mean, there is more capital available for you than you could ever have imagined in a different situation. Yeah. That's interesting. And and it's interesting that when you talk about, you know, solar wind EVs, like this sort of places where the technology is fairly mature, fairly deployable, and we're just like way behind what we should yeah. be deploying. Like this is the thing that drives me insane about that part of the equation. And I'll speak here from personal experiences that we have a house upstate that we put a huge solar array in. We're moving now. I'm doing geothermal this spring. We've got a wood stove, which is, you know, carbon free. We're taking the trees that fell down. We're going to get to pretty close to net zero for that house through these various investments. And the thing that's fascinating to me is these are off the shelf. I'm not doing anything. This is all consumer technology. I'm just purchasing it. There are people that can do it. Now, the thing about it is it's expensive. Like the idea that it's like paying for itself is like, it's like (laughs) not, it's not actually right. Like this is essentially a choice by me, someone who is lucky enough to have the disposable income to do it. And because I believe in it, it doesn't really pencil out. But what's maddening to me about that is that like, there's a lot of money in the world. <laughs> like, if, like, it's like, if that's the problem, that's a solvable right. problem. That's what sort of drives me crazy about this particular moment on those technologies. There's other stuff that isn't solved, but on the technologies that are there, it's like, yeah, they're too expensive. So just pay no. for them. Like, <laughs> but Chris, like, that's there's not lots the of problem. money around. That's not the problem. I mean, it's not, it's a part of the problem. But, but it is No, no, problem. no, because, because the... The question that you should ask about that, all of that investment that you've put into that is what is the value from a climate perspective? And the value is not you being net zero. That's meaningless from a climate perspective because you personally being net zero doesn't matter. Right. Because, you know, climate is good. Because like you said, unless every single person can do it, it's meaningless. It's hugely meaningful as a market signal. You're actually going and buying products that are on the shelf that. You know, yes. now there's now someone has to restock that shelf. Right. Which is why I'm doing it. Right. Like I'm a, I, I, I'm aware enough to know that. Yeah. Which is great. That's great. That's hugely. That's great. Yes. The idea that you could then make that into a network effect and every single and, and we can now build what you have on your house upstate everywhere is, you know, you run into a ton of other issues in order to try to extrapolate that to a a city, a state, a country, or the world. And some of those things are eminently solvable problems, super actually relatively easily solvable problems. It's a mindset shift. And some of those things are not that. Like scaling technologies that are commercially available and like a little more expensive than they should be, just that little slice of the problem, right? Just scaling that. Yeah, I mean, sometimes that is a money question and some of that capital is flowing now that wasn't flowing before. But like just an example. There is a lot of hydropower in Quebec. I always say that about Quebec. I always say, that's a land of lots of hydropower. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, it's like when I, think, when I think about Quebec, I think about hydropower. 
I think about the fact that, you know, they were able to give Washington, D.C. A, a baseball team. Like, those are the kinds of things I think about. Yep. I don't know if I think about anything else when I think <laughs> about Quebec. Um, now I think about truckers. But when you think about Quebec, there's a lot of hydropower. There is a large part of New England that needs renewable energy in order to satisfy yes. climate goals. And for yep. over a decade, there was this brilliant solution. Bring all of that hydropower, which isn't being used in Quebec, and give it to the people in New England who desperately yep. need it. The reason why they couldn't do it is because you can't run a power line. Uh, you can't run transmission from Quebec to Massachusetts without going through either Maine or New Hampshire. And Maine and New Hampshire were like, well, we don't get anything from it. All the power is going to Massachusetts, so we're not going to allow you to permit this line. Like that is where we're, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about getting from your house to the world. Right. And I mean, and it's ridiculous. I mean, we should just. Didn't they just vote this down? Didn't they just have an actual like ballot initiative on it? They did in Maine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was like the third thing they tried to do. They're now going to bring it down to New York. So, you know, they're going to figure out a way to to sell um, Quebec Hydro. But now you're making me depressed again. See, I was hopeful and now I'm depressed again because- I'm going to make you happy ultimately, Chris. I promise. And the- (laughs) I don't know if that's true. (laughs) No, because here's the- Here, wait. I'm going (laughs) to tell you this because this is a good point. We're going to take a quick break and then I'm going to give you my, my, the pandemic lesson on this, uh, which I think is, is interesting. We'll be right back with more of our future energy conversation after we take this quick break. Okay, so, you know, to me, I think about the pandemic and climate related a lot, right? Because there's certain parallels. I mean, you know, you've got a huge, it's a global problem, right? It's a collective problem. It requires both like policy and innovation. It's got, it's the intersection of like economics and behavior and governing and policy. You know, it's got all these things and the whole world trying to solve it together with varying degrees of success. To me, the most like amazingly American thing about our pandemic experience, which is like sort of depressing (laughs) about how I think about climate is like American innovation in producing a vaccine was like the most incredible story of innovation ever. Like they and it wasn't just American. Obviously, it was it was happening across the world, but it was also mines from other places in the world because we're a country that's cosmopolitan and open to immigrants and all these brilliant people come here and they do incredible things. And. We created this, they sequenced it in like a few weeks in freaking February, and we got it to market and we we tested it. And then it's like <laughs> this like a bunch of people are just like, God damn it, I won't take the goddamn vaccine. And we have this like the lowest vaccination rate in the OECD <laughs> among globally <laughs> countries, the highest death toll. People are dying by the thousands every day from a goddamn preventable death because they won't put a freaking shot in their arm because their brains have been eaten up by the virus of <laughs> propaganda <laughs> misinformation and then i think about that and i'm like this is an eat like to get you back to your question about like the questions we're going to encounter at scaling energy are hard ones like put the vaccine in your arm is an easy one and we can't do that one <laughs> it's like so when i think about climate i'm like oh my god oh my god we can't get people to take this shot that is free and safe and effective and will protect them from hospitalization and severe illness Like, how are we going to solve climate? So now make me feel better. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, because we have a shot in less than a year. We have a shot that prevents this thing. I mean, feel good, man. Like you, you, yes, about you are really, really well protected because you've decided to believe in the, in, in the magic of science and you've done it and it's, and it's worked for you. And, and we have had, we have a very, very like small snapshot in time about what this truly would look like. What what would look like? What a a need for long-term vaccination for coronavirus would look like. Right. We have other examples where we, you know, yes, there's anti-vaxxers on the right or the left who've been there for a long time and have been wrong for a long, long time. But it's not nearly as big as the swath of, of vaccine skeptics who are out there right now for the coronavirus vaccine. So we do have some mm-hmm. indication yep. that people are willing to change their tune. And yeah, it seems crazy yep. If what you believe is like all of the information you're getting, all of your community is supporting, like it seems crazy to not have that. But the truth is, is that we don't all live in those communities. We don't all get that information. So there you go. Right. Like that is pessimistic. And again, like climate. 
that's not a coronavirus part problem. We've done an amazing job no. at the coronavirus. No, problem, no, that's right? right. No, that's a sociological. Pro- that's a that's a, yeah, it's a human, human institution, institution problem. Right. So yeah, we're gonna have that same. Right. But like, who knows what it looks like five years from now when it's likely that we're gonna have to have like coronavirus boosters for a while, and you know that's gonna keep us safe. And right. you know, hopefully, we're able to uh, the better wisdom of. Our lives are going to be able to convince that uh, convince people who are skeptical. If we look at the climate scenario, there's going to be those things. And the question is, like, how beaten down do we get from those kinds of things or how excited do we get from the fact that we made a shot in a year that prevents a disease that we never had a shot for? I mean, (laughs) right. But the parallel here, right, is like. The dam, like a dam's an incredible thing. If you've ever been to a hydroelectric dam, like it's an awe-inspiring thing. I was in the, I I went to the Three Gorges Dam in China (laughs) and looked at their control room, which is like out of a Bond film. In fact, the control room is behind opaque glass that they hit a button and becomes clear. (laughs) And there's all these people, the functionaries who are running the dam. Like that is awe-inspiring technology. And so to me, the corollary here is the awe-inspiring technology of a hydro dam and the voters in Maine being like, don't you dare run that transmission line through my through my sure. state. It's like that's the core of the contradiction we have to overcome. Yeah, but so then the question is, what is the solution to the problem with the transmission line, right? And the solution right. there is, that's been, that was actually, that's sort of what people call nimbyism. I mean, like, that's something that's been around in power distribution forever. And it didn't really matter because, like, you could cite fossil fuels wherever you wanted to, pretty much. You could, del- yep. and if you can cite fossil fuel extraction, you can deliver things. I mean, like, let's be clear. These things are amazing, amazing substances. Coal is dirty and terrible and also amazing. And gasoline, there is nothing that has the energy density of gasoline. Like, we are not going to ever fly, you know, around the world in electric in, in electric planes because of how heavy batteries are compared to how light yep. liquid fuels are. These things are magical. It's amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we did. But we've created a construct of regulation of expectation that's been based on this thing that we've had for hundreds of years or hundred something years. And now we just now we need to change that. We need to change the policy. We need to change permitting. I mean, like, you know, we need to change everything. But like those things, like I can look at that situation with the power line and I can think of different ways. And you could think of and a bunch of people could probably think of much better ways. They were much smarter than me, much better ways to do it. But there are ways to solve that problem. We just haven't addressed it yet. But now, like, let's try to address it and let's be practical about it. And let's like not get into a situation where we feel like there's somebody evil in that particular thing, right? Like, because the evil people in Mm -hmm. that scenario are people in Maine or New Hampshire who live a particular lifestyle who are like, wait, 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 why am I having to deal with this? That's a completely legitimate question to ask. And we should just Mm -hmm. be able to answer Mm -hmm. that question in a different Mm -hmm. way than we ever have really tried to do. And I don't know. I just have a feeling. I just have a, you know, I, maybe I'm again, like it's, it, it might be, you know, it might be my mother saying like, don't tell people they're stupid. Like, I just feel bad of always like, yeah, no, totally. like, I don't think that's what it is. Yeah, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't believe in telling people yeah. they're stupid. I really don't. I mean, I, I'm strongly yeah. against that. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's not how I conduct, you know, it's not how we do the show. It's not how no, I, no, I know. I, I, I know you don't. Um, and it's not how I feel about, it's not how I feel about sure, the vaccine, sure, sure, right? Sure. I mean, I, I want people to, to come to this and I, I, and meet people where they are. And I totally, it's more just that I guess the point that I keep getting at is like, in a weird way, it's like the tech stuff is really hard. Yeah. And it's easier than the other stuff. You know, it's like it's like the innovation stuff is super difficult. Yeah. And then even after you get that, you know, even after you solve this very hard problem, which is like, how do you get running water to produce electricity at scale? Or how do you even design high power transmission lines that can move over long periods of space? You know, that itself is a hard problem. You know, you solve that and then you run up against yeah. these other problems. And that's that's the sort of, that's the allegory of the vaccine, which again, is not a reason to get beaten down. It's just that like, it's going to be a lot, a lot of different problems are going to have to be solved in a lot of different ways at all times. Yeah, but this is the stuff that you talk about every day. I live in a world that is that I'm often talking to people in Silicon Valley and like, you know, the libertarian streak of of like innovation and tech development. And like they are definitely misguided when it comes to the impact of policy. But there is nothing like the impact of policy on this particular problem, because all of these are the most heavily regulated industries in the world. We want them to be heavily regulated. Like we don't want people to just be able to build something anywhere they want to with no safety precautions. Like yes. we we want yes. we want the FAA. I have a new nuclear plant I'm putting up in my backyard. 
<laughs> right. And just to be clear, the nuclear plant is a, is a lot safer than like, you know, if people are just like going out and being like, oh, well, we yep. can do whatever we want with an airplane. Like, no, I'd prefer them not to yep. be falling out of the sky. Right. So we want these things to be regulated. Right. And that is a huge opportunity for us. Right. And that regulation, and that's the place where like, you know, again, I talk to the private sector and I talk to the public sector and they, you know, you also have done this in your reporting and the way that you run your show. Like, they don't talk to each other real well. They never have. They always, right, they yeah, always yeah, like, yeah. It, it's always the other one's fault. Right. And like, the truth right, is, yeah. is like, this is a scenario where those conversations have to be like as in lockstep as possible. And it, they're getting to be that way. They're understanding each other and opportunities in each other in ways that I at least have not seen happen before. And that's a, that is a, that's a, a moment of optimism anyway. Like the idea that like you can address these issues and if we're able to build these market structures that allow communities to thrive, that allow industries to succeed, that allow products to get on shelves and like people are like open to that, you know, regulators yeah. are open to it. Companies are yeah. open to it. Innovators are open to it. Like people are open to that future. And it is what the future, what the opportunity is. I mean, everything in the political world always sort of devolves to the problem response, but like, you know, so everything's like, oh, there's going to be billions and billions of clean energy jobs. And it's like, well, it depends on how you do it. Like there might be, there might not be. In some right. places there are going to be fewer jobs. In some places there's probably going to be more jobs. But like the point is, is that it's a huge opportunity for innovation and growth and all these things. Yeah, well, and to me, the clean energy jobs is a little bit of a weird label. Anyway, I, I think it's effective yeah. messaging. But you're, to your point about like everything you're seeing in my shot on our Zoom sure. conversation now or Riverside conversation now was like produced by fossil fuels. It's like, right, well, everything's a clean energy job in the <laughs> right. yeah, economy yeah, sure. because yeah. that's what you're doing. Like, that's what the economy is, you know? Yeah. So, so like, you know, we, we just got to figure out how to get everything that way. I mean, I want to talk to just to sort of now circle back. We sort of talked about some of the tech. We talked about some of the mature tech. Then our conversation went to the fact that, like, even if you have pretty mature tech, scalability is a problem. Regulation is a problem. Like, there's all this stuff. Let's sort of wind back to the tech because there's two areas I think that are worth talking about. So, this idea of kind of like electrify everything and then zero carbon electricity, right, is like one sort of place to do this. But then you've got the heavy industry problem. You've got the gasoline, the battery in the plane problem, right? Which is that as a chemical structure, gasoline just is like not replicable. It's just more energy dense than any substance on earth. The energy density allows you to put a relatively small amount of it to burn at a, you know, incredible hot <laughs> rate as you fly over the skies in tons of steel that make modern air travel possible. The Temperature, again, this is not my area of expertise, but the temperature that you can achieve using fossil fuels to melt things or to make steel, for instance, the industrial process that you make for concrete, very hard to replicate without the energy density of fossil fuel. So let's talk a little bit about how to think about the stuff that's really unsolved mm -hmm. problem in a tech sense. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's not an, an like, that's not a single question. It's a thousand different questions. Yeah, of course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it's important for it to be a thousand different questions. And for us to say, how do we create the constructs to allow the thousand different, you know, not to be too maliced about it, but to allow the thousand different flowers to bloom. And I think that yep. one of that is the understanding that you're, that you're suggesting now, which is that like, there are some of these things like there is a there is an electrification plan for the world that is very difficult, not just because of these permitting and regulatory things. But at some point, if you say, well, let's forget about nuclear, then you need to find all the space for wind and solar and you need to figure out what the um, what the reliability aspect of that is. And there's a lot yeah. of different solutions to that. Tons of different solutions. Right. By the way, let's put a pin in the nuclear because I want to circle back to nuclear as the next thing. Sure. Let's do that. But when you talk about things like steel and cement and you talk about liquid fuels because and liquid fuels are like hugely powerful, incredibly important things, then the question is like, are there multiple different pathways? Are there what is the impact those pathways are going to have on ultimate price of these products? Because that's really what what matters in a lot of ways is like how much is like a, a ton of steel going to cost and how much is a liquid fuel going to cost? Because it's not like we don't have the technological pathways to do these things. They're just super, super expensive. So, you know, fuel for planes is a great place to start. Like there's six or seven different ways that you can create zero GHG 
uh, net zero GHG liquid fuels. Some of them are less energy dense than the current kerosene product that most airlines are using. So, so then you would have to potentially deal with either flying for shorter periods of time or recreating engines or something like that. But they're not, they're drop in fuels. So you can use them right now. Oh, really? That I did I don't think I even knew that existed. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You can create it. You can create it through biofuels in a way that's net zero. You can create something that's called huh. uh, power to liquids, where you actually create it through through power generation. But they're very expensive and they're not scaled and they're hard to deal with. That's one of the things that we're trying to do with, with Breakthrough Energy is to say, OK, so, you know, we think of um, when we think of the success of any of our investments, we think of it through two lenses. One is what we call what Bill called green premiums in, in the book that he wrote. How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, Everybody Should Read It, which is basically the premium between a clean product and, and a fossil fuel incumbent. And so right. number one is how you get that to either zero or close to zero so the whole world can implement it. And then the second is like, what is the actual greenhouse gas implications to this particular thing? So right now with sustainable aviation fuel, there's no way to create it at scale where that green premium isn't like astronomically high. So then the question is like, well, which one of these pathways is going to be most likely to get as close to zero as possible? And which one of these pathways is going to be most scalable? Those two things are not necessarily the same thing. So, for example, right now, the way that most of the sustainable aviation fuel is created on the planet is through fat. It's basically through spent vegetable oil. And it's like it's an right. refined into a product that can be dropped into a plane engine and a plane can fly. It's amazing. Like, that's just amazing, right? Like, I mean, like, let's that's just cool. take a second I mean, like, cool. to say that, like, yeah. the stuff that comes out of the fryer at McDonald's can be made into jet fuel. Yeah. The, the thing that's is, cool. is that's that very cool. there's not nearly enough of that stuff to fly all the airplanes we want to fly around the world. Right. So, I mean, you know, as much as we love McDonald's. But you can get that to a re- relatively affordable product. So then the question is, like, well, what's scalable and affordable? Well, some of these other ways might be that. It might be like like taking alcohol like uh, like reliably and sustainably sourced ethanol and making that into jet fuel. Well, that's a great possibility. We just don't know how scalable it is and how much feedstock there is, but let's like really take a shot on goal there and try to build some of that stuff, get it into the market, see if it works. People are investing in all of these different things. We're investing in most of these different pathways. No one knows which right. is going to win, but what we need to do is take all of the shots because ultimately what we need to do right now is create the market environment for these things to succeed. And it's not right now. And the market environment is like a euphemism because it's like hard for, for largely the private sector for, for, uh, to understand. The market environment really means like what companies are willing to invest in because of what policy is driving those investments. Right. And right. there are right. ways to marry these things up again that are super, super productive and that allows for more products to get into the market and for allows us to figure out which one of these things are going to win. So that's just that's just air. That's just aviation fuel. And then, like, if you look at steel, multiple different ways to do that. There's ways to do it through hydrogen production, which like one of our partners, ArcelorMittal, which is one of the biggest steel producers in the world, has put like an amazing bet on taking hydrogen and making steel. There's nobody who understands steel making better than they do. Well, there's you know two or three big steel companies and they they know that you can actually take hydrogen if it's, you know, if it's net zero hydrogen and turn it into steel and have like unbelievable impact on, on GHG reductions for steel. So that's a different thing, but that's not the, then there's other, other methods and other approaches that are super expensive right now because you can make like one little bar of steel that we need to see whether or not scaling that into a global industry is going to bring that, those green premiums down enough. So we're sort of right now, Again, if like you want to be excited, which I want you to, I want you to come away optimistic from this conversation. That's my goal as well. I, I mean, most of what I do during the day is just mo- like you know marinating very optimistic <laughs> yeah, things. Know. You know, just thinking know. about how great everything is all the time. So, <laughs> how functional our politics is. No, I do. Is. <laughs> Not, I I do both. I do at both a rational level and also at an instrumental level because I honestly think that like. I think doom is enervating. I really, this is a, 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 no, I'm serious. I think this is like a real, like, I actually think this is a, a very profound and sophisticated part of Don't Look Up, which people hammered for being like, you know, too sort of like simplistic and polemical. But I think the fact that like, at a certain point that, that Jennifer Lawrence's character, when the asteroid's going to come, is just like, screw it. 
and just goes and works in a grocery <laughs> store. Like that's that's what I want to avoid for all of us, because I think to the point that we think that it's coming and there's nothing we're, we can do to stop it, then everyone's just like, well, screw it. It's a real problem. It's a real problem. It is a very tangible yeah. and real problem. <laughs> um, so this stuff yeah, is yeah, exciting. Yeah. Like even just yeah. hearing even just hearing you say, well, yes, of course, there are many, many very smart people with capital behind yeah. them working on this very obvious but very difficult problem, which is how to get to net zero right. steel like, and net zero airplanes. Like, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you look at and, and these people are serious, like they're serious people because it's yeah. not just the companies that are making the commitments. It's the engineers who work at those companies who yeah. now, you know, every day, that's what they do is that they're trying to figure out how to make sure that we can create steel without, you know, killing everything on the planet. I mean, you you started this by saying that we could go from two to three to four to five to seven to nine degrees. If we get to nine degrees, like, but yeah. I think that like, no, I mean, cause then like you go to cement and there's a bunch of exciting things happening in cement, ton of exciting things happening in cement. So like it, they're not scalable right now. They're super expensive. They're, you know, some of them are on a piece of paper and they're in a, you know, they're in some like right. brilliant, like chemistry undergrads notebook somewhere. But like people are thinking about this and they've never thought about it so much before. I saw a quote about, you know, there's this there's this really unproductive, I think, in fact, potentially like defeating d dynamic that happens in the climate conversation, which is like, are we supposed to innovate or are we supposed to deploy? And the answer is like, that is the most ridiculous thing in the world. We're supposed to innovate and deploy and we're supposed to do them both more than we've ever right. done either of them before. And we're supposed yeah. to do it faster <laughs> than we've ever done it before. But the idea that innovation is a threat to deployment, just you don't understand how the world works so much. And so I saw this thing that was like, well, if science, if science could have figured this problem out, it would have already. And it's like, that's not how science works. Science no. works when you put tons of resources into scientific yes. innovation. Yes. And we're just at the like early, early bleeding end of putting the of putting we're not we're nowhere near putting enough resources, but we're putting real resources right. into it now. And it's amazing. I mean. If you talk to yeah. somebody who cared about cement and the issues of cement related to climate change five years ago and now, the person is way more optimistic today than five years ago. That's interesting. Let's talk about nuclear. And, and I want to talk about nuclear for a few reasons. <laughs> One, and I don't know if you've experienced this, but there's a weird thing with people in nuclear where every time you talk about climate, there's a kind of person who's a <laughs> nuclear obsessive. <laughs> It's the strangest <laughs> subculture. It's also bizarre because every email reads like every other one, but they're not copied and pasted. But all the people who are like nuclear fetishists email in exactly the same tone. Maybe you listening right now are those people and you've emailed me. I've read your emails. I, I don't like I'm trying to separate out the facts and the merits of the sure. argument from the weird obsession that a certain brand <laughs> person has with it. My view on nuclear is like, the question of new nuclear deployment is a question similar to the questions in other spaces about scalability, safety, regulatory. How safely, how, how feasibly can you build and, and scale net zero energy using nuclear? The question of removing nuclear seems a no-brainer to me, that it's like idiotic, like massively idiotic. I'm curious how you think of this. Yeah, I mean, you know, the people who are emailing you, I'm sure, are telling you that there is no greater source of carbon-free electricity that's reliable, affordable, and that is like ready to go right now than nuclear. And they're telling they're that's basic. Yes, that's a that's part. That's one sentence. Keep going. <laughs> Another sentence is that more people have died from coal production in like by Got a thousand yes. times than than nuclear production. And ding, yeah, ding, ding, yeah, ding, ding, I, ding. like I, it, 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 and all those things just you know. All those things are true. It very true. And there are huge totally. problems with the current nuclear fleet. I mean, it is it's actually incredibly expensive to run nuclear plants right now. It's hard to dispose of waste, though it doesn't need to be. We make it harder than it really needs to be. Again, innovation is a place that can that can help with that. Right. You know, proliferation is something that's scary. It scares the hell out of me. So I'm just like, it should totally. scare other people if there's proliferation risk, I was, you know? I was morbidly joking to someone the other day. I made this joke. This is like the darkest joke you could possibly make. Where I said, like, 
It would be grimly funny if we end up with a nuclear apocalypse, like a retro version of Doom that, that, that forestalls us ever getting the climate apocalypse. And like after we had all gone through like, oh, end of the Cold War, like under right. the desk, like all that stuff. And now it's like climate, climate, climate. And they're like, oh, wait, we still got thousands and thousands of nuclear warheads sitting around. And like that comes back. To yes. Get stuff. No, that's true. And now, of course, with with what's going on. No, that was. Uh, yes. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the moment when you think about it. And it turns out. That they're not unrelated. Part of the reason why there's not a part of the reason, it's not all the reason, part of the reason why there's not like a unified European um, uh, uh, voice in opposition to invading Ukraine is because Germany made some pretty they, they the made gas. some pretty stupid decisions related to nuclear. Yeah. Like that's the thing. It goes back to that nuclear. Right. right? Like they shut down a bunch of nuclear plants. They are without a real solution because of a f- completely false idea about what the impact of nuclear is from an environmental and climate perspective. But here's the thing, like old nuclear. Oh, I had yeah, to put that connection go. together. <laughs> so they need all that natural gas. They're using that natural gas for, for electricity. I mean, they're legitimately in an energy crisis right now. It, it, I mean, the yeah, price of yeah. energy in Germany is so, so high. And the idea of shutting down that pipeline is, oof, that is a, uh, that's yeah. not something that that a new German government is as as no. as liberal as they are with their and and the Greens as as necessary as they are to that coalition. They can't do that. Yeah, and so right. like this is how I think about nuclear. Nuclear fission and nuclear fusion are both remarkable reactions that have incredible potential. The problems with nuclear that we all know: proliferation, waste, cost just security. So it's not just like, it's not just like a big nuclear explosion. Like you don't want a little thing, right? Like you want none of of those. Those are all scientifically, those are all problems that innovation can solve. We, uh, uh, Bill has invested in a company called TerraPower that is a fourth generation nuclear reactor that was specifically designed to say, okay, let's look at like the big five problems with nuclear. Can we solve them? And if we can, can we make it affordable? And it certainly seems like it. I mean, it's an early stage innovation company where it's going right. to, you know, we're going to demonstrate this new type of reactor that gets to enable wind and solar and also provide reliable electricity in Wyoming. But like the idea that we would foreclose nuclear is just, I mean, this is where the, and yeah. this is where the or propositions of climate just fall flat on their face. Because, totally. Yeah, because yeah, yes. you you need to you need to inv- investigate everything, especially those like super promising ideas that are saying nuclear inherently is not a problem. A nuclear reaction is an amazing thing. It creates byproducts that we maybe don't want to deal with. So let's figure out how to deal with them in a way that works for us, and let's go then do that thing. Like <laughs> we <laughs> we know how to regulate it effectively. The NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Com- um, Commission, is something that people often say is is so terrible and overburdensome. They are the gold standard regulator in the world. They know how to regulate these things. So we've got a good regulator. We've got great technologists who are like looking at the problem. We've got some real promising innovations in the, in the future. I mean, like I'm, if, if we didn't, if nuclear wasn't what you said, the dynamic, because it's on both sides, right? The anti-nuclear people are also like, they will write oh, yeah. you the same, you, you'll do the same thing. No, it's like, it's like Israel, yeah. Palestine. It's like when you do a segment on it. Oh, yeah. sure the emails and they are all, they all have the (laughs) same cadence talking, you know what I mean? Which is not to say like to to belittle any people who are in those fights. It's just that those fights and debates are so well developed and so intense that everyone's been through the same dialectic. It's true. It's hard for me to see the anti-nuclear bent of the climate movement. Cause that to me is like such a paradox in and of itself. Like even saying that sentence is absurd to say. Um, and like you see, like green parties in Europe in particular are like the most adamantly opposed to nuclear. And they're the ones who are saying like their top focus is climate. And it's like you can't say both of those things. So, no. no. Well, particularly if you're taking existing yeah. nuclear offline. I mean, that to me is like. <laughs> well, and you're not investing enough, in innovation right? in nuclear because like innovation in nuclear gets to solve a whole bunch of problems. Like there are, there are, there's huge right. heat potential with, with nuclear. There's huge, you know, there's obviously reliability with nuclear. There's like all these other things. It doesn't, and, and it doesn't take away from needing to deploy tons of wind and solar. We need to do that too. <laughs> yeah. The other thing about it too, I have to say, you know, when we, we, I think we all had that Chernobyl moment. It was right before the pandemic when the, HBO came out and, you know, Michael Higginbottom's book on it, which is totally amazing, which I, I I read. I had him on the podcast. I love the show. You know, it's funny. 
if you had asked me how many people died in Chernobyl, I would have said like two million. Yeah, exactly. I would have said like half a million people. And it's like <laughs> thousands. And then, of course, we don't know afterwards because there's there really are enduring effects of radiation. No one's saying that's not the case. Sure. The yeah. scale of the disaster in human terms is smaller than the scariness of the destruction of an entire sphere of human life and activity, the endurance by which that will, you know, last. Like, there's all these features of a nuclear disaster that are terrifying, rightly so. But in the sheer raw human terms, I mean, this gets back to the point about how many people will die from coal. Like, the other forms of energy generation are killing many, 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 many more people. Right. Right. And you can also look at Chernobyl in a completely different way, because like the real way to look at Chernobyl is that there was a bad regulator. There was a really poor product that was built. And if you build a car that doesn't have doors and that doesn't have a reliable engine or brakes, it's probably going to crash and kill somebody. And that's really what what the story of Chernobyl was, because, you know, that that was like totally foreseeable. Yeah. You look at like what happened after the tsunami in Japan to the nuclear capability there. And the question was, well, why? Well, look at that. That's a modern nuclear disaster. That's like, and it wasn't a modern nuclear disaster. It was a diesel disaster because they put the generators yep. below sea level <laughs> in a place that had tsunami risk. Right. And so, you know, there. I mean, listen, all of those things were done for good reason, right? right? Like, like Russia needed to like put out electrons very quickly right. in order to develop. And, and that was the cheapest way to engineer that particular you know, part of that particular plan in Japan. So it's not like, again, it's not like people are dumb when they're making the decisions, totally. but they're they're foreseeable and they're solvable. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that we need to say, well, we're not going to do that thing. Because there's no, yeah. again, there's no pathway we can't explore right now. We have to explore everything. I think explore everything is a great motto and a great sort of way to think about the future of energy <laughs> and, and the built environment, which I actually, again, I have a kind of opposite of doom perspective I'm holding on to. And I have to say, Jonah Goldman, you've been very, very helpful in, oh, good. in maintaining that. This was really a great, great joy. I really enjoyed it. Oh, me too. Thank you. I hope you're a little bit more optimistic. I am. I genuinely okay, good. am. Good, 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 good. Once again, my great thanks to Jonah Goldman. That conversation is really, really, really sticking with me. Just talking to someone who's really thinking as intensely as he is about the scale of what needs to happen in so many directions. It's both, it's sobering and invigorating at the same time. I think that's where I ended up on that. At the top of the episode, I mentioned that we recorded this conversation earlier in the year. Since then, of course, there have been major energy shifts since Russia invaded. The U.S. is no longer purchasing Russian oil. Sanctions have been imposed. Uh, The pipeline project in Germany that Jonah referenced has halted, which is a huge deal because that pipeline project was the source of a lot of controversy. Also, things may continue to change and evolve in terms of how energy is happening. And one way of, of looking at this as this being the decisive moment that accelerates the green energy transition in Europe, and I hope that's true. Also, today is the last of our Future Of miniseries. Uh, We had a great time. I learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed it as well. But guess what? We're just back to regular old whiff pods in your ear holes starting next week. We've got some really amazing ones coming your way. I'm excited to share those with you pretty soon. Why Is This Happening is presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to NBCNews.com slash Why Is This Happening. 